Kevin Byrne, Senior Vice President of Public and Community Relations. What exactly does that mean to the good people watching this? Well, not it is that much different, but it's now Executive Vice President. They've, uh, well, they've congr thrown congr that congratulations. out Congratulations, as of when? Yes, uh, last couple months okay. or so, yeah. Um, it basically means that, that if you want to connect with the Ravens, you just can't call Joe Flacco or say, hey, Coach Harbs, you know, I'd like to talk to you. I can't? You no, know, no. So we're basically, uh, in the group I work with, we're the conduits, where we connect us and the community. And that the community includes the media, and includes community relations work, uh, includes all the things that we might be doing in, in uh, uh, the other world of websites and all that stuff. Uh, with Michelle Andres as our vice president there. So it's any way you can connect with the public, I have some finger in it. Well, we'll get to your tenure with this franchise uh, in, in a second because you've been with this franchise since the days in Cleveland. Yes. Um, but first, we're taping this, I mean, days before the regular season opens. Um, August 29th, we're taping this. Is this your favorite time of the year? Uh, if not, when is? I, mean, I, I would assume playoffs when the Ravens are in the playoffs. But, playoffs but, is pretty but, good. But describe this time of year for somebody within the Ravens front office and within the organization. You know, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking, to be honest. First of all, we have to, you know, as you know, Sean, 90 players we've had for a while. Not, and then we go to 53 and all the tension that comes with that. You know, most players are insecure. Probably 10 to 12 said, I'm here for sure, but the rest are very nervous about it and they're uptight and coaches are uptight so it's an uptight time and and until you play that first game you really don't know you see hints of like well I think we're pretty good but you have to play that first game against another NFL team with the big crowd and the television audience and show okay yes it's all working we've got off to a good start we're a solid team now let's get on to game two but but I'd say of all the 12 months this is probably the most nerve-wracking time. Fantastic. I, I think that um, this is just the, by far the most exciting time for a football fan, I think. I mean, oh, yeah. obviously you get to the playoffs, it's different, but, you know, everybody has that hope. Yes. I mean, there's 32 cities, and, you know, you can think of how many other fan bases and, and, and kind of, um, you know, surrounding those 32 cities that – have that hope and that, that, that think that this is going to be their year. Is this the team, the year that the, the, the team from the bottom jumps to the top and makes, right. makes the, the playoffs, wins their division, because um, we see that parity so much in the league. Um, well, the NFL has built that system. Yeah. They're, they're, the NFL league office, they're trying to get us all to 8-8. Eight and eight. You know, if we were all 7-8 and eight or 8-7 eight and seven going into the last game of the season, the commissioner in the league office would be doing flips. So would the networks. Mm -hmm. It meant that every game, you know, somebody was going to win and it was going to be dramatic for that one and somebody was going to have their heart broken if they lost. They're getting closer and closer to getting everybody to 8-8. Eight and, eight. And, and unless you have Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers, you're in that mix of, you know, we, if we're smart, we're going to be in the mix. And even when we haven't made the playoffs the last couple of years, what does it come down to? It's come down to a play two years in a row, so to speak. And that's how close it is, and that's the drama that is the NFL. You mentioned the TV networks. A big part of the TV success of the NFL is due to your former boss, Art, Art Modell, Modell, right? And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But let, let's talk about your history with this franchise. Um, when did you um, get? When, when did you get involved with? the Cleveland Browns, and, and what led you to getting on board with the Browns organization? Well, I was really lucky. I, my, I started my career in sports information work. I, my first job was at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and then I went from there to Marquette University, which was my alma mater, uh, and uh, they had a famous basketball coach there, Al McGuire. They were always a top five team in the country. They're still pretty good, by the way. And we won the NCAA championship. We beat North Carolina in the NCAA championship. And, uh, and the St. Louis football Cardinals came to me and asked me if I would come to them and work in public relations. And, and I went there uh, and then left basically because I didn't like the franchise. It, uh, it, I didn't think it was well run. And, um, and so I, I went to 
TWA, which is an airline that doesn't exist anymore, mm -hmm. but it was a worldwide airline, happened to be based in St. Louis as director of public affairs. And I'm sitting there, and people will remember Dan Deardorff was one of the voices of Monday Night Football. He's an old friend. He's a Cleveland area guy. I'm a Cleveland area guy. He used to call, and my assistant would come into my office and tell me that um, Jim Brown was on the phone or Otto Graham was on the phone. It was always Dan Deardorff. So one day she came in the office, she says, Art Modell's on the phone. And I pick up the phone, yeah, yeah, Art, what can I do for you? And indeed it was Art Modell. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he wanted to, somebody from the league office had told him about me and that I happened to be from Cleveland too. And he said, how would you like to return to your hometown? Come talk to me. So I went to talk to him and got the opportunity to return to my hometown, which is Cleveland, which was fun, going where I had a history. And, uh, and then voila, uh, we moved over here in 1996. So what year was that when you, when you went? 1981. 81. 81. So 81 to 96, you were with the Cleveland Browns. Right. Kind of sum up that experience because, like you said, hometown, there really isn't anything bigger than the Browns. Oh, the Browns are huge. E even when they're in losing. Cleveland. Yeah. Hey, you know, even Sean. when they were gone, yeah. when, when, when the Ravens moved yeah. over here, there still wasn't anything as big it. as the Browns. I know it. So, so, so for, it kind of like, I mean, like, I'm from Bowie, I'm from Maryland, and to get the opportunity to, to work in Baltimore, uh -huh. uh, basically my home, well, my home state, and basically my home market, it's a dream. It's pretty cool. So what was it like? It was, it was great. I would pinch myself sometimes, you know, I'd be driving down to old Cleveland Stadium, and I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, this uh, little guy from the west side of Cleveland, I'm working for the Cleveland Browns. And, and it was so meaningful to my mom and dad who, who didn't have any financial success and struggled you know, to make ends meet and, and had some real issues that it, I could tell that they were really proud that their son was working for the Browns. And, and the Browns are so big, I was a little bit public there just because the Browns are so big. And it was cool. You know, my high school friends, you know, they, they had all come to training camp and they're like, hey, come on, you want to meet Brian Seip? You know, and uh, it was fun. It was, I, I, I have to admit it's fun. It's not bad having a job that is other people's pastime. You know, so I was clearly aware when I was mowing the lawn that a lot of the neighbors were looking at me, well, that's the guy from the Browns, you know, and, and I wasn't sure what everybody else was doing with their lives, but they knew what I was doing. How do you have to carry yourself when you remember the Cleveland Browns um, organization and you live in Cleveland when you have all those eyes on you because I mean you're not a you're not a player but right. but like you said people are looking at you like you remember the that that's the that's the guy from the Browns right right well you can't go anywhere any holiday gathering any neighborhood gathering any friend gathering your work's always going to come up cuz it's the common ground mm -hmm. you know the great thing with the NFL where the NFL is so popular and, and this is not knocking the other sports, but there's nothing in the United States, and television numbers prove this, that brings a community together more than the NFL team. You know, a church can't do it. A president can't do it. You know, uh, um, other politicians, uh, baseball, basketball can't do it. You know, the Cavs win the championship and have a parade, but you and I both know if the Browns win a championship, that parade that the Cavs had <laughs> will not look as big mm -hmm. because the, there will be people flying from all over the country who used to live there to come there. So it's a, it's a great thing to have. But with it, Sean, it comes a responsibility. Sure. And, and, uh, and, and fortunately, I've worked with owners, Art Modell and Steve Bishotti, who understand that we have to be involved in the community, that our players have to be. So we make sure every player who comes to the Ravens is given some opportunity to get involved in the community. You know, they will be asked, how about this? Or if they have something, what are you interested in? And then we'll hook them up with that group. But we try to get every player, every coach involved in the community. So um, experience some success, some heartbreak with the Browns. Um, describe to me the experience of um, w when it's time to leave. Uh, both from a professional and a, and a personal standpoint, because, like you said, you grew up in Cleveland, and you grew up a Browns fan, right. and th now you're, um, you know, everybody knows the history. W what was that? What well, was that like? Even up until the end, I thought there would be a group of politicians coming in 
on white horses and save the franchise. I just didn't think it was going to happen. And then Art brought me into the office one day, Art Modell, and he says, look, you know, I've, I've signed some papers to move the franchise to Baltimore, and I hope you would come with us. And, uh, but I would respect if, if you make another decision. And, and then that news leaked out like three or four days later. And uh, so I still have cousins who don't talk to me. Is that right? Yeah, because I, I chose Art Modell. And I just felt, in my little way, I, I thought that Art, for lack of a better term, got the short end of the stick in Cleveland. They had built these new, the new arena for the Cavs. They had built the new baseball stadium, which was actually copied after Oriole Park here in Baltimore. And they had, the politicians then had promised, Art, once we get finished with those, we'll take care of you. Well, then there were new politicians, and the new politicians weren't going to help them. And we were unpopular at the time, frankly, because we had the most unpopular coach in our history, Bill Belichick. We weren't winning, and, uh, and so we had become unpopular. So it, it became a little ugly for us, despite the, the fact that we were so much a part of the fab fabric of the community. And when I kept seeing that the politicians would cancel meetings, would miss deadlines and things to do with art, so I knew it was a possibility, but I just felt there was somebody going to see the light and make sure it didn't happen. And then it did. And, you know, after I weighed some things, uh, weighed a couple offers that I had in Cleveland once that news got out, and realized that in my small way I could help art kind of tell the story that, for lack of a better term, he got screwed in Cleveland. And uh, I wanted to be a part of that. And I, plus, I love the NFL, and I love the competition, and I love game day. And so I made that choice. Uh, my wife and I, we have four children, so that was part of it. And we had one who was going to be a junior in high school the next year, and one who was going to be in the eighth grade. The other two were in college. And so uh, that was a factor, too, but we did it. Do you ever look back, or how often do you look back at that kind of kind of fork in in your life, kind of... And, and think to yourself, because everybody has them, uh, what if I chose yeah. the other way, to, chose to take the more popular road and, and stay in Ohio and side with the bulk of the community right. that, that were in favor of the Browns and against the move? I mean, do you ever think about that? I've never second-guessed it. Uh, you know, I've, I've never regretted it. Um, I made the right decision, and we've had... To, to us come and establish a team was a lot of fun. A lot of work, but a lot of fun. We have two Super Bowl rings already, mm -hmm. and we're a relatively young franchise, so I don't, I don't have any regrets about it. Um, so what was your uh, title when the move was made? I think uh, at that time vice president uh -huh. of something. <laughs> so, you were, so you arrive in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. you, you arrive... Um, you're now the Ravens. The Browns history is gone. Mm -hmm. What was it like in Baltimore... In 1995? I was just, <clears throat> I came here for the first visit, I think, in December of 95, and then moved over here like a month later as we, uh, we, we, we started working even before the league gave us approval because we knew we were going to be here. And I remember driving, you know, 83 and 695 and York Road and Reisterstown Road and, and, and thinking, oh my God, we are, n we're nobody. I mean, I, all I could remember is Orioles everywhere. And, and, and I'm leaving a place where we are part of the fabric. Everybody knows the Browns. And, uh, and it was just like, geez, oh, man, how long is it going to take? And the first thing we did, we reached out to the Baltimore Colts. And, and we got them together with Art Modell. And we wanted them to meet him to let them know he's not an Mr. Ursay the guy who took the Colts away. Are you talking about the um, former... The former... The, the alumni... Who lived in this area. Johnny that, that still lived in this yeah, area. Johnny Anitis, uh -huh. Artie Donovan, Lenny Moore, Stan White, mm -hmm. all those guys. Mm -hmm. And here, take a look at him. You know, see who he is. You see that he's not uh, uh, what Sports Illustrated kind of painted him as. And, on, and the first game we ever had here against the Oakland Raiders, we asked the former Baltimore Colts who were in this area, and they ended up being 57 of them, to line up and form a gauntlet that our players are going to run through for our first game at Old Memorial Stadium here because we played in there a couple of years. And they, we gave them jackets, it was a hot day too, that had Baltimore Colts, they're white jackets with the Colt logo on the back. 
And then we asked them that once our players went through, if they could reverse their jackets, and on the other side, it was a purple jacket with Baltimore Ravens. And it was like them visibly telling the community, it's okay to root for these guys. And uh, it, it, was, it was visible, and uh, I think it was important to this community. Whose idea was that? Uh, yeah, I think it was mine. Okay, I was, <laughs> I, I was going to ask. So, what, I mean, what, that is, um, that, that's a great... I That's just, a great plan and idea. I mean, how was it received? I, the the standing ovation, which huh. was great. You know, and, and convincing the Baltimore Colts to do it. We had all the Colts lined up except Johnny Unitas. And I remember telling Art, well, it doesn't work if Johnny's not here. <laughs> yeah. So I called John through somebody who knew him well and I had become friends with. And I said, hey, what's the deal? And he goes, I'll tell you what. Give me a sit down with Art Modell and I'll make my decision. Then John came in and sat with Art and told Art that um, NFL veterans aren't treated well enough by the league office and we need help and we need a voice in the owner's meetings. And Art says, I will be your voice from now on. Uh, I will champion NFL veterans at owner's meetings. And Art did. For years it became a, a real cause for him. And John came back after that meeting and goes, I'll come and I'll put on the jacket. And I go, yes. Put him right in the front of the line, of course. You know, but to have Johnny there and Lenny Moore and Artie Donovan, Hall of Famers, big deal. Um, has there been any, um, it, it, over the years, has there been any kind of, I guess, from the, from the, from the Cleveland perspective, has there been any kind of let go of the angst and stuff because I mean I, I remember I went to Ohio University in Athens and in 2000 when 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 you won the Super Bowl you know I I kind of underestimated you know the Browns were back uh -huh. that area obviously so many Ohioans the Browns are back to have their team and um, they were actually making some noise in those years right they um, were reasonable right <laughs> right yeah and I thought maybe it had been let go, but I tell you, driving down or walking down Court Street and seeing the reaction after the you know, leading up to the Super Bowl and after the Super Bowl, it was, um, I couldn't really wrap my head around it, you know? Um, what, did you hear, what, what was the, what, when you win that Super Bowl, we'll talk about the kind of like the more positive, right. but what was the, the, I mean, was there any kind of. There was some vibe and, from Cleveland. Um, that you stole it. Baltimore stole our Super yeah. Bowl. That should be our Super Bowl. That should, Ozzie should be our general manager. Ozzie's ours. He's our Hall of Fame tight end. He's not Baltimore's. So there was still some of that. I think until the Browns win a Super Bowl, there'll still be a lot of anger towards Art Modell in Cleveland. And it's, you know, I, I feel somewhat responsible that we weren't able to tell his story better. You know, he very much wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a rich man. Mm -hmm. You know, he was borrowing from banks all the time, and uh, he lost his leverage to borrow more, so he couldn't build a stadium himself. You know, you either had to come up shooting. The politician kept saying, we'll get it done, we'll get it done, and they finally, Al Lerner, ironically, who helped, who, who helped Art move to Baltimore, set up the meeting for, for Art, and then becomes the new owner of the Browns, he's the one who finally convinced Art, Art, you don't have any... No more banks are going to lend you money. And, and uh, you are not going to be able to pay your debt because the stadium's such a pit here. you got to move, and I'm going to set you up in, in, to Baltimore. They're looking for a team, and you should move to Baltimore. And, uh, and then Art took the meeting and eventually agreed to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this, the first part of this conversation really wasn't meant to be a history of <laughs> Cleveland Browns, but it kind of ended up that way, I guess. But let's, get, let, let's focus more on, right. on the Ravens here. Um, what do you remember about um, the, the the early years of this franchise and the fans that came on board? Um, were they more uh, the old Colts fans? Were they more of a of a of an older age? Because you know I was born in 1981, and I still remember the day that I found out the Baltimore Colts were 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 a, were a team because um, my, my my father. Was was from Montreal, Canadian. He brought me up on hockey in Washington Capitals, <laughs> and living 
I grew up in Bowie, so living right outside D.C., I mean, you're kind of born a Skins fan, uh -huh. and there, were no, there was no Baltimore team. I didn't even have a choice. Yes. So, you know, the, the National Football League wasn't, wasn't huge in my house growing up, but I still followed, followed Washington. And so, but I still remember the, the, the day I, re, I, I found out there, were, there was a Baltimore Colts because uh -huh. I was in fourth grade. I think it was language arts. And it's vividly in my mind. Uh, my, my teacher was wearing a, a Baltimore Colts sweatshirt. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, are you an Indianapolis Colts fan? And okay. she said, I, I don't like that Indianapolis team. <laughs> I'm a Baltimore Colts fan. And I said, what do you mean Baltimore Colts? And she explained it to yeah. me. And it kind of like dawned on me, wow, Baltimore had a team. So there were, had to be a whole generation of, of, of kids like me in 96 when you move over here that... Um, I mean, from the fringes of Baltimore that really didn't even know that the Colts existed exactly. at one point. So were mo most of the fans of the older generation, or or how? Or, originally, what did you find? originally, yes, that that most of them were uh, Baltimore Colts fans who missed them after thirteen years. Um, but we also focused on 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 selling to people who were twenty five to thirty two, and that they were not necessarily spending Baltimore Colt fans. They were fans. They went to games or watched with their families because that's what teams did. You know, you gathered in the bad weather and Thanksgiving and the holidays and you watched the NFL team. You mm -hmm. watched the Colts. So uh, we had to reach all of them. I, I, we, I was worried that uh, would we sell all of our tickets, you know, and uh, uh, but they all came and they've all stayed, which is pretty good. And we build a new stadium and they've come over to that one. So it's it, I, was, I, I can tell you this, Sean, I can remember coming into work one day, maybe it was our second season here, and I saw two cars on the way to work, a half hour drive, with Baltimore Ravens stickers on their car. And I was so excited. <laughs> I was so, hey, we're making a little bit of den here, you know, they're, they're paying attention. And I remember arguing with, with uh, people at, at MAR television, you know, when, when uh, during training camp, I'd turn on, and it happened to be a year where the, Ra where the Orioles might not be doing very good, and I said, we had more people today watching us practice here at McDaniel College than went to Oriole Park last right. night. Come on, pay attention. And then I remember our preseason TV ratings were like five times what a regular Oriole game Gets and I'm saying, look at the numbers. You got to start paying more attention to us. You know, arguing for, for the Ravens. No offense to the Orioles, but yeah. that's that was our job, my job, and uh, and it kept growing and growing. And then magic, you know, in our fifth year, mm -hmm. we win the Super Bowl, and we do it in unusual fashion. We do it with a crummy offense that doesn't score a touchdown for five consecutive games. We do it with the single best defense for a, for a year in the history of the NFL. And all of a sudden, the ripple was everywhere. We were, it was purple everywhere. And, and hopefully we've stayed good enough and stayed interested enough in all the communities to keep that going. Well, you win a Super Bowl every dozen years. That'll help. That helps a lot. Tell me about that first Super Bowl. Well, it's one of those things, you know, and fans are the same way. We're the kind of the same way. You don't anticipate it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, you just, holy cow, we're in the playoffs, and uh, we have a home playoff game. They're playing... A really good team, the Denver Broncos with Mike Shanahan, and we beat them. And we just club them. And it was really that game I started to realize, because they were good offensively, that, that this defense might be able to carry us no matter who we play. And, uh, but then the next week we were playing the best team in the NFL, the Tennessee Titans, there. They were the best team, clearly the best team that year. And uh, I don't know what their, their record might have been 13-3. and three, And we went over there. And we just manhandled them. And, uh, and then we had to go to Oakland, which was a tough, rugged team in the black hole of Oakland. And uh, we could have played them a week, and they wouldn't have scored two touchdowns. Mm -hmm. we, we, and plus, we took out their quarterback, Tony Saragusa, hit Rich Gannon. And then I remember, this is a funny story about the first Super Bowl. I'm on the bus going to practice on Wednesday in Tampa, the Wednesday before the super, first Super Bowl. And I'm sitting with Brian Billick, our head coach. I said, Brian, do we have a chance of winning? Because I was concerned. And he goes, we're going to kick them all over the field. I said, well, how can you just say that? Mm -hmm. He said, okay, 
would you rather play the Giants on a neutral field or Denver at home? I go, Giants. And he went on, you know, he went for the next games. Who would you rather play? And every time I'd say, I'd rather play the Giants. I say, he goes, that's why. They're going to have trouble scoring a point against us. And their defense isn't that good, and we're going to score points. And it should have been the only shutout in NFL history for the Super Bowl. It was 34-7, to and their lone touchdown came on a kick return after one of our touchdowns. Was that, is there a better feeling um, doing what you do? Is there a better feeling than when the clock hits zeros and you're just kind of watching that? I mean, it's not easy for you and your team no. because then a lot more work starts. Right. But is there a better feeling or is there a better kind of work than that? The best feeling is to get on the bus with your team to go to the airport the next day and to fly back to Baltimore. Because you're flying back as champions and you're bringing that trophy back to the community. And, you, and you're with people you work with and respect, you're with friends. I don't know what that'd be worth. I couldn't put a price on it. But those moments are so, so special that, uh, holy cow, look what we just did. It's hard to do that. And we did it. And, uh, and, and in a league where they're trying to get us all to 8-8. Eight eight. So it was, I'd, say, I'd say, yeah. That flight back from New Orleans and Tampa with the two Super Bowl victories, I'd like to have more flights like that. <laughs> so you talk about Tampa. What about the, what about the one in 2012? Well, 2012, you know, we, we were okay on offense and we were okay on defense, but we weren't dramatic in one way. And if you look at the playoff route, we had to beat Andrew Luck, who was the young stud at the time. That was before he got hurt. Uh, and, and then uh, in, we had to beat Peyton Manning in Denver. And, and we had, um, who am I missing there? We, oh, and then we had to meet, of course, in the AFC Championship. We had to go back to New England, the team that stole it from us the year before, but really not stole it because we had a player drop a touchdown in the end zone, and then we had a kicker who missed a 33-yarder that would have sent it to overtime. But the, the, the play before that, two-day play before that, right. we should have won it, and it had, should have gone to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. And so to go back to that place and the drama involved with there, and now we're going to face Tom Brady, Holy cow. And then we go to the Super Bowl and we have Colin Kaepernick, who was the hot young player with Andrew Luck at the time. And we did it. And, I, and I, I was thinking at the time, when they look back at this, if we win this, they're going to look back at us and say, look at the quarterback, look at the Hall of Fame quarterbacks they beat in that playoffs sure. that year. That was the feeling I had then. And, uh, um, and, and John Harbaugh and his family, the Jim Harbaugh you know, was the other coach. There's so many other pieces to that. Ray Lewis's last ride, sure. and then what we all know, the spectacular play of Joe Flacco through December and January and then February in the Super Bowl. He was unbelievable. He, was, he made such a run uh, and was so exact with his throws, made no mistakes, and uh, that's, those are the things that come to my mind immediately. Um, so you mentioned the... Look, you think about the Baltimore Ravens, and the Ravens are one of the few organizations in the National Football League where you think of them and you immediately think of success. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned, relatively new franchise, two Super Bowls, playoffs routinely. Playoffs routinely, and if we're not in the playoffs, it's coming down to the last game. So that leads me to what I was going to ask. I mean, the drop should have been two straight Super Bowls. The last couple of years... Oh. Um, I mean, this easily could be, um, over the last, what, six, seven years, um, you know, take 2015 out of the mix. I mean, you, you, we could be talking, like, playoffs every single yes. season, AFC North, yeah. Super Bowl appearances. Um, wh what does, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't kind of dwell on that. You can't, you can't think about that, but does, you, do, does your mind ever wander, like, Man, this could be, and there could be even more pictures of trophies. I know, or, I know. You know? Well, but you know what it does, Sean? It because um, I know fans think that way, right? It, 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 it. Internally, we know it's hard, but you look around, and uh, it's good ownership, right? With Steve Bishotti. it's a personnel department that's 
top of the line. And Ozzie Newsom is historic. If Ozzie Newsom wasn't already in the Hall of Fame as a tight end, as a player, he might be in there as a as a Hall of Famer general manager. And so you have you start with that. You have a Super Bowl winning head coach, John Harbaugh, who, by the way, in his first five seasons, goes to the playoffs every year, sets a record that way, and wins at least one playoff game every year. And then it's six out of seven years. You get a little spoiled. You get a little angry, I would say, not so much with the fans. Fans seem to have a better understanding. But with you guys, the media, you know, I have seen more often they haven't been in the playoffs three years in a row than I've seen anything else. You never get reminded that, well, this is the same group that's had this playoff run. But that's the nature of the beast, and we understand that. It's cut and dry. You either are there or you're not there. And when you're not there, you're a have-not. And when you are there, you're a have. And then when you get there regularly, it's like, okay, when was the last time you won a Super Bowl? All right. The so expectation. We're, we're still close enough, but, but that's always the journey. But that's always our journey. Our journey, you know, we're on the eve of our, you know, 2018 season. We're not thinking about making the playoffs. We're thinking about winning the Super Bowl. We can do this. We can do this. We, give us some relatively good health. We'll be a Super Bowl team this year. That's, that's our mindset. That's how we pick players. We pick players who like football, who like the physicality of it. We pick players who like being in the weight room to get bigger and stronger. We pick smart players who can run a sophisticated offense and defense. And then you mix it all up and you have great leadership with John and his assistants and Ozzie and Steve Bishotti and now Eric DaCosta when he takes over as general manager. It's a pretty good mix. As we wind down here, just a couple more for you about kind of like the the, the, the internal kind of workings of this place. What is it like to work with John Harbaugh on a daily basis? He is relentless. He is vigilant. Um, anyone who's a parent, who's a teacher, anything you do, most of us will let something slide that they're uncomfortable with. Well, I'm not going to talk to that person about it because it's not that big a deal to me in the greater scheme of things. Um, but that takes away greatness. He is relentless in terms of if he sees something that's not right, he's going to tell you and talk to you about it. Perfectionist. It's, yes, but there's a different word. It's a created word from the Ravens. We have carefrontation. Instead of confrontation, it's carefrontation. If you don't respect the person who's not doing what you think he or she should do enough to tell that person, and it doesn't have to be in a harsh way, then you don't care that about that person. So the term carefrontation, which Steve Bishotti came up with, is very much a part of who we are as a franchise. So that it might be as simple as simple as saying, hey, Lamar, that's not the first step we take back from the snap. The first step has got to be here, and this is what it's going to be, and you're going to do it until, and Lamar can say, well, look, I'm one of the fastest guys in the world. I've been fine getting away, and you can time me. I'll be faster than every quarterback in the league right now, and John will still come back. He's, yeah, but you'll be a little faster if you put your foot there. You know, it's, it, it's something as simple as that, or it's something as simple as um, – uh, um, some song we might play at a home game where somebody will say, why do we play that song? Who are we appealing to? I mean, thought is put into everything. And then you go to the guy who's selecting the music. Let's not play that song again. Is that John? Or, is, or it in could o be in other John. Words, it is, could be is me. It, any, could, is it could anybody, be Steve. Is anybody encouraged to yes. uh, care front yes. it, yeah. from, from you, Steve, or John, or players? I mean, is, is everybody encouraged to take part in that kind of mantra? I think everybody is, but there are some personalities that won't do that. And there are some personalities that just absolutely detest confrontation. Can there. you survive in the Ravens organization if you can't be carefronted? Yeah. If you're thin-skinned, you're, you're not going to last long. Right. Be be because even when a person confronts you or carefronts you in a polite way, and you can agree, you know what? I should have taken that extra step. If I had gone to talk 
to um, Alex Collins before he met with Sal Palantonio and just uh, I could have teed him off that, look, he's going to ask you this. I missed it. I missed it because I didn't take the extra step, you know, because I trusted Sal and I shouldn't have trusted him. That's my fault. You know, and so if, if somebody sees that, well, well, did Alex know he was going to be asked that question? I said, I should have, I have to be willing to admit it, and that hurts. I came up short there. Next time, hopefully, I won't come up short. But it's that type of envir environment. We, we, John came up with a term when his first two years here, you know, he would talk to the team. He says, look, guys, I have to have armadillo skin, and so do you. So if you don't like the way we're practicing, I expect you to come and tell me we're practicing too hard, we're tackling too much, or we're not practicing hard enough, you're not getting us ready. We need some more physical parts of practice. Whatever it is, if you don't care enough about your team to do that, then we're not going to be the best we can be. And so um, uh, I, I think it works here, and, uh, but, I, but I do agree with the premise of your question. If you're a little thin-skinned, it's harder to work here. What about Steve Bashotti? What's it like to work for Steve Bashotti? Because you, you talked about Art Modell and what kind of a man he was. What about Mr. Bashotti? He just has a knack of expressing himself uh, in different language and seeing things just a little differently. I'm going to tell a story about his mom that, that would be typical of this. So his mother's older. And uh, I was asking about his mom. This is a couple years ago. And he said I had to tell my mom that she's wearing too much perfume. And uh, now my mom, in her last 20 years of her life, wore too much perfume. And I, I, we just tolerated it. When, when my mom walked in the room, you knew she was there. And when she left the room, it lingered because she had too much on. And Steve says, you know why? My, my mom doesn't do it on purpose. My mom does it because her sense of smell as we get older isn't as sharp. So she has to put more on until she smells it. So somebody, as somebody who really cares about my mom, I had to tell her, Mom, you're wearing too much perfume. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, I would have never even thought of having that conversation with my mom. And my mom would have greatly appreciated it. But it's just a simple thing on how Steve sees the world and handles the world differently than the rest of us. And then that's why he's had success, I think. Beautiful story. Has he ever told you you wear too much cologne? Is he is not. No. I'm not. I'm not a cologne. I'm not I don't smell anything, for the record. <laughs> um, how has your job changed over, the, uh, over your tenure, specifically over the last kind of decade? I mean, it must make you and your staff's job, I mean, infinitely harder with the advance in social media and the way that the world is so much smaller than before. I mean, you can only... I mean, control might not be the right word, but you can only, um, well, I'm going to use control. Uh, your athletes and your coaches, to a point now, before it was easier, let's put it that way, now athletes can connect with fans at a, uh, in a second with a tweet. And, or a, or they, a and they want to increase their brand. Yes. Because they believe, and their agents have told them, you increase your brand, you make more money. Mm -hmm. So Case in point, Odell Beckham Jr. Exactly. So, so how, is, how, how much more difficult has your job and it's your staff's constant. job? It's constant. Yeah. It just doesn't stop. There, there are no deadlines. It used, it used to be a news cycle, right? So that if you got past the 11 o'clock news, you were safe till 7 in the morning. Yeah. That's not anymore. Right. You know, it's just now the, the call could come from Coach Harbaugh, hey, are you aware of this? Or, and it could be at midnight, it could be at 4 in the morning. Uh, the man doesn't sleep very much. Uh, it could be Steve Bishotti. We were playing um, on the road in Indianapolis, and you think you're safe the morning of the game. Oh, I'm going to relax a little bit this morning. And he calls, and he goes, are you aware of this on our website right now? And uh, I go, uh, to be honest, no. And he goes, well, you should be aware. And, uh, and, and I want you to look at it. And, of course, it's something I look at and I go, well, we should pull that down right away. And so I call him back and say, we pulled that down right away. And, of course, then he wants to know, well, who put it up and why did they put it up and what did they think? And I said, well, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to care front them. Yeah, we're going to care. <laughs> it's a good word. I love it? that word. Now. I mean, I'm going to use You're going to use it the rest of your life. Do people know about that word? I mean, uh, serious question? Not, 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 I think Do people know about the care front It's been a little bit public, but it hasn't been as public as it I should be. I think it's be. a great word. Because yeah. I, I, I kind of operate under the premise of do things the right way, not the easy way. Right. 
And the easy may the easy way might be the right way sometimes, but usually the right way isn't the easy way. So um, okay, well, just so quickly, I know we're going to wrap up. So sometimes, because we're all competitive people here, the voices will rise, and then you know, it gets confrontational instead of carefrontational. And so I've had a couple of those with Coach Harbaugh, uh, and uh, and and we're close, and we have to work together all the time. And so the first time I have it with him, and of course he's got a, uh, a new contract at the time, and uh, and I have no contract, and so I'm I'm. I'm shook. I'm driving home thinking, holy cow, you know, did I just really mess up here? And then the next morning I come in the office, I'm still a little shook. First guy in my office in the morning is John Harbaugh, and he goes, isn't it great that we can talk to each other that way and get things <laughs> off our chest? And I go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he's the, he, yeah. that's why he's a head coach. Yeah. That's why he's yeah. a leader of men, because yes. um, I'm sure when he was, when you guys were had your voices raised, right. he was already thinking two steps ahead about the next morning, right. probably. Or maybe, yeah. But, but um, listen, uh, I want to ask you this. So I asked you about the change in your job and how it is a little harder now. It's relentless, like you said. Um, the, the, the national anthem controversy, we won't get into it, but with this coming about, is this the most difficult um, obstacle or roadblock yes. that you faced or your staff has faced in th that you can remember? Yes. Well, we went through the Ray Rice situation. Sure. And, that, of course, that video changed yes. everything. Uh, but this is the most, this, this has fragmented our fan base, and, uh, and, it's, and we haven't solved it. You know, uh, I think our players have resolved it. But the fans, you know, we, we had players kneel one game, happened to be in London, uh, and I, we have fans who still bring it up that like our players are still kneeling and they're not. But that's how offensive it was, especially in a city where the Star Spangled Banner had been written. I think that's all a part of the fact that it was on foreign soil. Uh, and frankly, you know, not to make this political, we have a president who likes to stir the pot. And he, he likes to reach out to his base, and he likes to bait players. Mm -hmm. And he, I think as long as he can continue to do that and get a reaction, and until we find something to placate everybody, I don't want to maybe placate's the wrong word, um, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a from a generation, we did revolt. We did stop a war in Vietnam, uh, and we did march. And uh, um, so the, the players... Uh, want to make a point about how everybody's treated not the same way in the United States. And it's, that message is lost in the shuffle. It's become about the flag, and that's not the point. So we have to find new ways for the players to express that and and because uh, the business aspect, best aspect of it, we, our business has been hurt by it. Mm -hmm. And we'll see, I mean, look, and, and I would expect the night before that, that Eagles-Falcons game, I mean, yeah. Not to make it political, but yeah. something's going to come up, right. and then the, the night before, you know, that Saturday night before the opener, right? Something's going to come up. We'll right. see, you know, we'll see how how that uh, that's resolved, and um, you know, I think everybody's hoping for a a um, a resolution right. to this. Um, not everybody's going to be happy right. either way, or okay either way. Maybe you know, a, a civil resolution right. to everything. Uh, hopefully, that all. It has many, out. many layers, very, Sean. Very, very much so, very much so. We'll, we'll end on kind of a, a more positive topic. Favorite player Ooh. from over all of your years? A favorite player? Well, the guy who lives next door to me in the office is Ozzie Newsom. Okay. So when I went to the Cleveland Browns, he was one of the, the go-to guys. Like you have go-to guys after a loss, you know Ozzie's going to speak. Need somebody to go to the hospital in a special case. Ozzy was a guy who'd go to. You know, he's become my friend. I sit with him on charters with our team, and so uh, I'd have to put Ozzy in that category. And close to it, uh, I would put Ray Lewis because I went through trauma with Ray in the trial in Atlanta. Uh, we became very close through the years. I find him dynamic, inspiring, and fun. Uh, and and so. Uh, 
but Ozzy would be probably the first, and, and Ray's not too far behind. What is, um, what's going to be like without Ozzy here? Well, he's going to be here. He's going to be here. But he's not going to be yeah. in the role. Yeah. What, 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 I mean, it'll, be, it'll certainly be different. Bizarre. Yeah, it would be. But he and Eric work so closely together that uh, the early transition, those first couple years, will, will be okay you know, for the people internally. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he is. His, his fingerprints are everywhere on this franchise with Ozzy. But Eric's been here since the beginning, too. And so uh, Eric has a different way, uh, probably will assemble his staff a little differently, uh, but I trust Eric. Uh, I, I really do trust Eric. And I know how Ozzy has complete trust in Eric, and that's a heck of a imprimatur to have when Ozzy's saying, that's the guy I want to replace me. And then fi final, I asked you about your favorite player. Is there a favorite non-Super Bowl season that you have? Uh, from all your years with this franchise, um, a season, not 2000 or 2012, that, that kind of jumps out at you. Um, well, we had a 13-3 and three season with Steve McNair as our quarterback. And we had, it, it, at the time, I felt we have all the pieces. God, if we just could get a quarterback. And we signed Steve McNair, and we go 13-3, and three, and we get a home playoff game, and we have Peyton Manning coming into here. Yeah. And we hold him without six. a touchdown. Yeah hold him without a touchdown, and lose the game. Because Steve had a couple bad plays in the game in the red zone going in, and it just happens that way. But that year, I was thinking more than most years, we are got a real chance here to win it all. And, uh, and, that's, and that was a lot of fun that year. Because I, I felt, you know, you, you, you're, you probably are less confident in the business than you were outside. Fans are probably saying, we're, we're going to win. But you're always looking at the downside of it. I'm, I'm always, in fact, Ozzie Newsom will talk me off the ledge a little bit. And so I, I'll say, Ozzie, are we going to win? Are, are we going to beat the Patriots? And he will never say we're going to beat the Patriots. And then, uh, then, then I'll start going, well, they have Tom Brady, and they, they have Gronk, and they have those linebackers, and they have Seymour. And, and, uh, and Ozzie will go, Kevin, we have good players too. And they, he, that's how he calms me down. I have to remind myself, we have good players, too. We'll see how it shakes out this year. Yeah. One more, and I'm going to try and end all, all of my interviews like this. Um, your advice to people out there listening or watching, uh, you're a rather successful person in your, in your industry, in your field. You've been doing it a long time. Your advice to people out there of any age, really, um, on how to be successful in their line of work or in really anything they do, whether it be uh, academics or athletics or what have you. If you're not passionate about what you do, uh, then get out. Do something else. Because it's hard. I can't imagine not being passionate about what I do. You know, I have good friends who are teachers. I have a sister who's a teacher. I have a son who's a teacher. And they are passionate about teaching. It's important to them. My wife's a teacher. Yeah. You've got to be passionate. You've got to be passionate. And so, and if, and, if, and if you're a salesperson and you don't believe in your product, then go sell another product. I, I, I just don't think you can be successful if you don't believe in what you're doing. So I've been so fortunate to, to and blessed to be in a, in a, business where I get to compete and it's and it's public people know we either win or we lose we're either smart or we're dumb and uh, so it's great to be a part of that and it's great to be surrounded by passionate competitive people who want to be the best uh, at what they they are and when we are then we win championships and we go to the playoffs all right and it's fun Kevin Byrne thanks Sean thanks for sitting down with me all right Appreciate I enjoyed it. it all right me too